Okay, so now we're going to talk about radial drainage because that's what you're going to have to do for your project. All right, so uh, we are going to derive, um, we're, I'm, I'm going to go through the differential equations pretty quickly, but we are going to derive the differential equations for uh, one-dimensional drainage, uh, for, I'm sorry, for radial drainage. But again, like everything else we're done, that's for understanding. You know, you're not going to have to solve those. Uh, and there's two uh, different boundary conditions we can use to solve this equation. There's one that's called free strain and one that's called uh, equal strain theory. And we'll look at the differences between those. You, 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 you definitely need to understand the difference of those and decide which one you would use and why. Um, and then we're going to talk about the smear zone. And uh, um, we're going to have one group that actually does a significant analysis on how big that might be and how much difference that's going to make. The rest of you can decide how you're going to deal with the smear zone and the problem. I gave you, by the way, I gave you guys a really good reference on this. Um, um, what I think is the best, there's, there's newer stuff than one I was reading, but not anything that's as comprehensive that, that I've seen published anyplace. So it's a, I think it's a really good reference on that. Uh, and a very practical one, too. Um, then you, ought to, you obviously got to be able to compute uh, the degree of consolidation using radial drainage. And uh, finally, we're going to talk about Carrillo's method, which is just a very simple, simple method to combine both the vertical and the horizontal drainage without doing a, a calculation. Thing. By the way, you could, if you, are all excited about it, you can try and use, uh, you can use um, um, Settle 3D to, to do the, they, you can put sand drains in Settle 3D and, and start running the problem. Okay, so let's just talk briefly about what it is. Uh, how, how many people have, dealt, have projects that, that have, have worked on a project that dealt with vertical drains at all? All right. That's what I like to see. Okay, so this is the installation of a vertical drain. It's a real common uh, set up for one. If you, you look carefully at this, you'll notice this is a marine environment, right? Notice you got a sailboat there and some uh, other ship out there, and this is a real common place in a, in a coastal environment where you got really soft deposits, very much like where you're at right now. And you can see here there's a very large embankment being placed, and you can see all these little um, things sticking up are the vertical drains, and these are actually bundles of vertical drains that are going to be used. Notice at the back of this uh, piece of equipment. That's where the spools are being stored. Um, and this is a lance, and the, the drain, drainage material basically runs all the way up the lance and back down. Uh, and it goes inside the lance, and the lance basically pushes it down the end. The original drains were actually called sand drains. They actually drilled holes, and they took little things that looked like big socks full of sand and put them down in the hole and everything. And, and the thing that made this work really well are these prefabricated vertical drains. So what you're essentially doing is punching a bunch of holes in your compressible layer. So if I could slice it open, basically you got a whole bunch of, 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 of drains in there. And then the, drain, the drainage path is now going to be this way as opposed to out the bottom and out the top. You, you still will have drainage out the bottom and the top, depending on what your boundary condition is. But notice how much you can shorten the drainage distance. And remember from our calculation, it's TV times HDR squared. So if I can take HDR and drop it by a factor of 10, I've substantially <laughs> increased the time. There's obviously a lot of work to do in this. You've got to punch a bunch of holes in the ground. Uh, and I forgot to bring my pre prefab drain material, but I'll bring it next time. Um, so when we analyze this thing, sorry, when we, uh, going the wrong way. When we analyze this thing, what we're going to do is we're going to analyze a unit, we're going to analyze a single drain. And, it, and, then, and then whatever happens around that drain, we're going to assume the same thing happens all over the site. So all we have to analyze is, is one single drain. So this is the process. Uh, this comes uh, from American Wick Dream. I think um, um, Hayward Baker also has a really nice little uh, um, animation cartoon of this. So it's, if you if you want to, there's you can find a lot of videos on this. And th did I put some, any links to videos on the on the uh, on the YouTube, on our YouTube page? I don't think I did, but you can Google it and find all kinds of them. Um, so you start with the. Uh, the, the lance is in, is in the, the lead system here. Uh, you put some kind of an anchor plate on the bottom of the drain uh, so that, so that it, it um, is attached to the bottom of the lance. You just push the lance in through the drainage material, and then the lance is extracted up. And as extracted up, that, that um, base plate or whatever you put on the bottom, sometimes it's just a piece of PVC tubing. It's like a half-inch diameter PVC pipe. That's all you need. It's, it, holds the drain down as you pull it up, and then the lance is removed, and you cut it off at the top, and you have a drain. Um, 
So we're going to model this thing, uh, and I'm sorry I didn't bring the drainage material here. I'll bring it next time. Is anybody who's actually never any, never seen any of the drainage material? Who's not ne never seen the drain material? Okay, I'll I'll bring one. It's it's pretty simple stuff. It it looks like um, I'll draw it real quick just so we know. So you have a you have a rigid plastic uh, core to it, and there's a, it, it can either be shaped like this or some of them are kind of zigzag like this. And around that is wrapped a non-woven um, filter material. Um, and so it, it, and they're, they're about four inches wide and they're about eh, maybe a quarter of an inch thick. I'll bring some samples next time. I completely forgot to bring them this time. Yeah, there are, there are all kinds of pictures of them on Google if you want to Google them. So we're going to model this thing in a radial coordinate system. It's, we're going to, it's just, although it's a three-dimensional problem, we can model it in two dimensions using an axisymmetric system. So we're going to model it in radial uh, coordinate systems. Uh, the, the, in the inside, we're going to have what's called the, the, the drain, or it's called the well a lot, because it's, when you analyze it, you analyze it as if it were a well. Right next to that, there's going to be the smear zone. When that, that lance that goes down in is much bigger than the diameter of the drain, plus on the bottom, you've got this either base plate or this piece of pipe. So the soil right around the, the drain gets, gets uh, disturbed, and it's called the smear zone. So its properties are going to be different than the properties of everything else. So that's, that's important to understand. And then we're going to have R sub E, which is the effective radius of the, of the well, of the, I'm sorry, the effective radius of the, the drainage radius. That's not going to be the spacing. It's going to be slightly different than the spacing. So, but that's the effective area, and we'll talk about calculating the effective area in, in a minute. So we use RW for the radius of the well, RS for the radius of the smear zone, and RE for the effective radius of the drained area. So if you put in a square pattern and you have S, um, then what we're going to do to calculate R sub B is we're going to put the, the, if you want to think about the tributary area around it, would be a, would be a square. But we want a, circ we want a cylinder in there, so we want a circular area. So we're going to put a circle, circular area in there, and we're going to calculate R sub E such that they have the same area, right? So pi R sub E squared is equal to S squared, and when you do that, you're going to find out that S is equal to 0.56. I'm sorry, R sub E is 0.56S. Um, if you have a, re a triangular pattern, then the represented area around that is actually a hexagon. Um, and um, you can do the calculation for that, and I'll just tell you, it's a little more complicated to do, but the same thing where we're converting the areas, and you get 0 0.525. So there's a noticeable, you know, there's a, uh, there's a noticeable difference between those. You know, it's not quite 10%, 8% difference in the radius. Um, and I don't know from installation, you guys, are you guys going to talk to installers whether they care whether they're square or rectangular? I don't know anything, of, I, I don't know that it really matters to them how they do it. Maybe one's easier to do. I don't know. But there is some difference, and you need to account for that. OK, so now let's look at our, how we're going to set up our, our problem. So our elemental volume now is not a cube, but a slice of pie, a very thick slice of, of uh, Chicago pizza, right? It's a little deep dish pizza action going on here. Um, so the, uh, the radial thickness of that is dr. The vertical thickness is dz. And then d theta is the third dimension. So the volume is, if you remember this radial conversion, it's r dr, d theta, dz. That's the volume. And we're going to assume that the flow is radial. So the flow is all coming out horizontally or radially in towards the center. So if we apply Darcy's law, q equals kia, so we can, we can, uh, we can write that, that um, Q is now minus K, still K, notice I'm using KR, it's a radial hydraulic conductivity. This is not going to be the same as a vertical hydraulic conductivity. That's one of the issues you're going to have to deal with. You're not going to have the same radial drainage as vertical. Is it, pro is it probably going to be higher or lower? It's going to be higher. Significantly higher? Could be significantly higher. This is another advantage of radial drainage is that you're going to intercept any high, high, high conductivity horizontal layers and, and potentially even get higher consolidation because of the effects of the horizontal drainage. Uh, so the only change in our equation is, you know, um, the, um, 
gradient is still d u e d r, but now we have an r d theta in the problem because it's because of the shape of the elemental area. So you probably can remember back to those early calculus days where you did stuff in cylindrical coordinates and everything. You know, instead of dx dy dz, it turned it into r d r d theta. So r d r d theta. All right. So here's our consolidation equation. Uh, the net flow now. Um, is the same as it was before, right? The, the net flow is, is dq dr times dr. So it's the same equation before, except now I've got this one over r term in uh, that I'm, that I'm going to have to deal with. So it's kr over gamma water, the second partial of ue with respect to r plus one over r due dr. So that's equation number one. And, if, and we're, we're just going to plug the same, we're going to go through the same solution we did before, except we got uh, radial coordinates now. So remember, uh, dv dt uh, was uh, v over 1 plus e times d e dt, but d e dt is a v d sigma time, or a v by the, by the change in, in, in effective stress. But remember, the change in effective stress is just the change in excess pore pressure, right? So our second equation um, for our, our, our conservation of mass equation essentially is that the change in volume as a function of time is the initial volume times AV over 1 plus E naught times the partial of the excess pore pressure as a function of time. All right, so we combine those two together. This is now the equation we've got to solve. Um, so we're solving for du dt because that's what we want to know. Um, and we just rearrange that to get du dt. And then we're going to we're going to define a new uh, uh, coefficient of consolidation, uh, and we're going to call it CVR. We're going to use the VR because we're now talking about radial drainage. So this looks very much like CV, except that um, I've got KR in it instead of. Um, instead of k. Other than that, it's the same, um, which is just equal to k over mv times gamma water. So that simplifies my equation a little bit. And I now have that the first partial of the excess pore pressure as a function of time is e equal to CVR times the second partial of the pore pressure with respect to, to, to distance. Now, this case, remember before it was it was du, dz, du squared dz, now it's du squared dr because it's in a radial direction. Uh, plus, now I have, remember we had, a, we, we, had uh, we didn't have this term in the last one because now I got this 1 over r term in there. So I got two terms in this where last time I only had one term in it. Uh, and if you look at Holtz et al., I, I, I tried to put the references to that, that Holtz et al. Um, book that I gave you a copy of. So if you look at that, um, that's equation three. That's chapter three, equation two. They, they renumber the chapters every equation in that book. So, okay. So now we're going to apply the boundary uh, uh, conditions for our free strain theory, and then we're going to solve that problem. So the, the the boundary equations for free strain theory are that I have delta sigma applied to the top, and that the excess pore pressure at the well radius, right, so that's the excess pore pressure on this face right here, is going to be zero for all time. So that's, the, that's my free drainage. So I'm assuming I have free drainage into the, into the drain. That's the first boundary condition. The second boundary condition is um, that for all r at time equals zero, the excess pore pressure is constant. So that's the same one we had before. We assume we have an instantaneously applied load. Pore pressure jumps up every place. And so my initial time condition is that I have the same drainage, I mean, sorry, I have the, the constant excess pore pressure across the radius. Uh, then my third boundary condition is for the place between, is at, is at the re. So at re, if you think about re, there has to be zero flow at RE. It's the equivalent to a, it's, it's the equivalent to a uh, impervious boundary because at, if, if this is the edge of one drainage 
area, then on the other side of it is the other one. Well, this one has to be draining that way, this one has to be draining that way, which means at that point there has to be no, no uh, flow. So it's the same as an impervious one. Or um, the change in excess pore pressure as a function of R at that point has to be equal to zero. So that's a no flow boundary. So those are my three boundary conditions. Um, the other boundary condition that's important is at the surface, the soil is free to deflect in the Z direction. <clears throat> so that means the settlement is going to be a function of both radius and time, because where's it going to settle first? Think about this. Where's, where's, it, where's a, this cylinder of soil going to consolidate first? Not, not on the top and the bottom. It's clo cl right next to the drain, right? So as a function of time, remember my excess pore pressure as a function of time is going to look like this, right? So it's going, to, it's going to drain here first. If it's going to drain there first, it's going to consolidate there first. Right? So this is that picture of that. So at t, at, at, at t equals t0, I've got this blue excess pore pressure. At t equals t1, I've got a pore pressure like that. At t equals t2, it's like that. So my settlement is going to be, if this is, the, this is not the undrained shear drink, that's the ultimate settlement. I should have put total there or something. But it, at, theoretically, at the drain, that's going to happen right away. I'm going to stick my drain in, it's going to drain, bang, it's immediately going to consolidate. So if you, want, if, you, if you looked over that site that we saw, you would have seen all these dimples out there. As it you know, it'd be like a, you know those little things at the mall where you put your penny in and it goes around, 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 you know, the little vortex thing? There'd be a bunch of those little vortex things around each one of those drains, right? Because as soon as you stick it in there, bang, it's consolidated. That's the equals, uh, the free strain theory. And I'm just going to give you the solution. Um, so this is a solution that looks really exciting, and I did I give you the? Uh, I'm just going to give you this whole thing here. Okay. Um, uh, so u u one and u zero uh, and and u uh, zero super two and u one two are Bessel functions. Uh, so Bessel functions are just Bessel. They, they may sound really confusing, but they're not. Bessel functions are just. Uh, uh, they're they're uh, geometric. They're, they're like sine and cosine, except they're for they're two-dimensional. They describe how the head of a drum vibrates. So if you think if you, you know, if you think if you hit the head of a drum in the middle, you know the first mode of vibration for that drum will be just up and down in the middle, right? And then there's a mode of vibration where one side goes up and one side goes down. And there's a mode of vibration where you have quadrants, where two quadrants are coming up and two quadrants are coming down. And then you can actually have higher modes where there's actually more than one. You know, wave function across. It's just if you think about that conceptually, that's what Bessel functions describe, which kind of makes sense that that would apply to our radial drainage problem. But they're just like sine and cosine, only harder to do. But you can look them up. Uh, um, Excel's got Bessel functions, so don't let them scare you. They're just another transcendental function. I do want to point out that um, you need to be you need to carefully look at your solutions. Some of these solutions are defined in terms of the diameters of drains, and sometimes they're defined in terms of the radius. So when you're looking at the solution that you're using, make very, very clear about which one it is, because you're going to be off by a factor of four if you use the wrong one. And, I'm, and one of the solutions I'm going to give you was based on the, on the radius, and one is based on the diameter. It's just a, it's just a question of how, who, how the person who solved it defined it. But make sure you understand how they, they defined it, or else you're going to get a bad answer. So this is my equation for u average as a function of time and space. Um, so um, that was the that was the uh, free strain theory. So the equal strain theory says that uh, it's all the boundary conditions are the same, except at the surface it says, hey, we you know this isn't going to consolidate in the center all of a sudden at the edges. It's all going to settle together. So I have to have a constant strain across the cylinder. So I don't get, I don't get more strain near the drain and less near the edge. It has to strain all together. And the reason people did this is they said, you know, we put these drains in there. I don't see those dimples forming all the time. And so somebody solved it for this boundary condition. So that's the only difference between the two solutions, uh, theoretically. So the strain is equal, which means the settlement is a function of time, but it's not a function of the radius that you are away from the drain. So S is uniform at the surface. 
All the other boundary conditions uh, are the same, but we, this one's different. So the solution to the differential equation, the differential equation is exactly the same, but the solution is different because we've got this one boundary condition that's different. And um, here's the answer. Um, this is the, there's the excess pore pressure as a function of time. Whoops. Um, um, this uses, this function uh, f of n is that counting function that we did before, if you remember. Why are you paging instead of doing what I want you to do? Um, uh, so this, this looks a little hairy, uh, but it's really just uh, n primes and logs. Uh, and the equation for the average degree of consolidation as a function of time is that. So this is the equal strain theory, okay? And uh, let me go back to here. This is the solution for the U average as a function of time for the free strain theory. So which of those two equations would you like to use? The other one, right? So, so I'm with you there, so the next question is what? If, if we'd really rather use this one than the other one, what, what do we have to know? We've got to know whether it makes any difference, right? So let's answer the question, does it make any difference? Well, here's the solution to those two, to those two different theories. Uh, so what's the answer to the question? Does it make any difference? Not after the time factor is greater than 0.2 or so. And when are we, you know, when are you, when are you going to get asked this question? When are, you, when are you going to be most concerned about the degree of consolidation? Yeah, 50% or later. So, so the short answer is it probably doesn't matter which one you use. So most everybody uses the equal strain theory because it's easier rather than the free strain theory. If you were really concerned about what's going on early in time, then maybe you want to look at both of them and see what happens. But clearly late in time, and then very late in time, there's a difference here very late in time, but at that point, you're at the, you're at the point where there's, you're, you know, you're beyond the point where the theory really applies because now you're at that point where you know, it's not going to consolidate forever with either method. So. so the answer is you can use either one. Uh, and I have given you, I do believe, Pretty sure I gave you this solution. And I think I gave you the, um, uh, I think I gave you the spreadsheet. Did I, give, did I upload the spreadsheet as well? Yeah, so I gave you the source. You can look at my, all my source data for this and you can manipulate it, replot it, do whatever you want. Um, if you use it, give me credit. If you're gonna use it for consulting, you better damn well check, make sure it's actually right. So I'm, I give you, this is a solution for the free strain theory. Um, notice we've got, we've got um, three different di uh, uh, dimensionless factors now. We have the, the radial time factor, and this one's defined as the diameter. Notice that? We've got U average, which is still the same um, number we had before. And then we've got N, which is the radius of the well to the radius of the, uh, the effective radius of, of the drained area. So now I have a whole bunch of different curves uh, for, this is as n increases. This is for n going up. And if, if those numbers don't fit the one you want to do, the, the n spacing you want, you can go into the spreadsheet and calculate for any n you want. So there's the equal strain, there's a pre-strain solution. Here's the equal strain solution. Again, this is divine. Divide, the, the, defined against the diameter. And then I gave you the spreadsheet that generates those. Okay. Um, so what if a, a, a smear zone exists? Well, if a smear zone exists, the differential equation didn't change, but we have another change in boundary conditions. Uh, and there's a bunch of different ways to solve the smear zone problem, a bunch of different assumptions you can make. Uh, some assume it's an impeded drainage boundary, and some of them just put a different K in there, but there's different, different ways to solution. 
So uh, the differential equation is the same, but equation five, which is the solution, is the same. And this, uh, this is, again, for the equal strain theory. Um, <coughs> and so this becomes a solution when you add the smear zone in there, where you've got a new, um, you've got a new dimensionless variable S, which is uh, the smear zone diameter, which is the, the diameter of the smear zone to the, um, um, uh, the diameter, the, the diameter of the smear zone to the diameter of the well, and you also now have two k's in here because you've got the k for the smear zone versus the, the kr, because you've got two different uh, hydraulic connectivities. All right, so that's all good. But how do we? We, we now need to calculate C, CVR. Notice this is not the same CV, right? So we generally get CVR from lab tests. Now, how do we normally do our lab tests? Take our hockey puck of soil, you know, it's usually take a slice out of a Shelby tube, and that's going to give us CV. So how do we get from CV to CVR? Well, one way, um, well, we're going to, we're going to get, uh, we're going to, one way is to take CV, use our either Casa Grande's method or Taylor's method, um, and then we, we can run a vertically oriented test. If we want to, if we get a big enough Shelby tube, we can cut the sample out sideways, right? And we can flip it over, and we can do a, vertic we can do a test where, the, where we're basically taking the sample and turning it sideways. Now, is that the same conditions that we're going to have in the ground? We're, we're now going to have flow, we're going to be measuring the flow. The vertical in the lab is now going to be horizontal in the field. So is that good? Does that solve our problem? What's different about that test than what's really going on in the field? What direction is the compression in the field? Compression is vertical, the drainage is horizontal. Right, so neither one of these tests is right. This is going to, you know, it's, this is, so the, the, what would make it the same is you assume the compressibility in the horizontal direction is the same as the compressibility in the vertical direction. Is it? Probably not. We know that most soils are, an, are, are anisotropic. So, but that's one way to do it. Um, so we, um, um, I guess I'm not paying attention to my slides as I talk. So um, um, our standard test, we're going to calculate CV, but we can run a horizontal test. But it's still not, it's still not quite right. Um, so we just cut the sam sample out sideways of a large, a large tamp uh, uh, um, cylinder. Another thing you can do, is you can run uh, a triaxial test, but use uh, horizontal drainage in there. And except in research, I haven't seen anybody actually put a drain down the middle of the test. You just run the test with with your normal. There's no way you normally run a triaxial test with paper around the outside to drain around the outside. You, you make sure the top and the bottom aren't drained, and you can do a consolidation. Now you got vertical compression and radial drainage. It's out instead of in, so the analysis is a little more complicated. But 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 now you're actually measuring in the lab the same behavior that you expect in the field. That's expensive. <laughs> so that's not particularly commonly done, but you can do that. Um, and so as I just said, so the drainage is generally outside the sample, not inside the sample. So uh, those are expensive tests to do. So the other approach is we just do our CV the way, and this is by far the most common approach, we do our CV the way we normally do it, and then we're going to estimate CVR from the CV. So what's going to be different? What's going to change the CVR versus the CV? What's the big property that's going to be different? The hydraulic connectivity is going to be different. Um, so if you remember, these are our definitions, right? The compressibility is also different, right? Oh, I'm sorry, the compressibility is the same because it's vertical compressibility. It's just the hydraulic connectivity is different. So if we combine those together, then we'd say, well, if, if it's just the hydraulic connectivity, that's the only difference, then CVR is going to be CV times the ratio of the hydraulic connectivity difference. So that's all we really have to do is estimate the hydraulic connectivity difference. Oh, man, we may be a whole day ahead of schedule here in a second. Um, so if we know KH over KZ, we can calculate that. Uh, generally, we don't measure it. Uh, if you actually have measurements, it's good. We're generally estimating it. 
Um, if it's really, really important, then maybe you do want to measure it. If you did, if you did really want to know the horizontal hydraulic conductivity in the field, what's the best way to do that? Uh, what kind of a test? Well, well, a, 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 a well, a borehole kind of test. Yeah, you could do a pump test probably. If 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 it's really clay, it might not work so well though. So. Um, so even for homogeneous, quote, homogeneous clays, you will find a difference in KH versus KZ. So even if you have a, if you, if you, if you don't have any inner bedding, if you've got a, if you've got like a varved clay where you've got, where you, you you've got diurnal cycles of coarser material uh, deposit during the summer and finer material deposit during the winter, you're definitely going to have layered systems. But even if you have a system, you have something like, like uh, bay mud, which doesn't have a lot of horizontal bedding to it. You know, it's not terribly anisotropic. Even there, you're gonna you're gonna have higher horizontal hydro hydraulic conductivities and vertical hydro hydraulic conductivities. Um, so if you look at Holtz, um, he's got some estimates of this. Um, so Holtz at all in that in that reference I gave you. So the, even for a Holt, so even if you have don't have any particularly um, significant horizontal bedding. It's still reasonable to assume that your horizontal hydraulic conductivity is going to be two or more times the vertical hydraulic conductivity. Um, for varved clays, it could be really big, and if you actually have inter if you inter have an inner bedding of silt and, and clays, it can be really, really high. So this is one of the really big advantages of these because you're in, any horizontal bedding that's going to help you, you're going to intercept it with the drain, and you're going to get much, much faster drainage. So it's really important that you do a good S you do you account for this. It's it, it's it's not it's way too conservative to not account for the difference between the horizontal and the vertical hydraulic conductivity. Uh, that's one of the big advantages. So I just said that. Okay. Ooh, man, we are like. Oh yeah, we are like almost done. Okay. Well, what do you do if you actually? Uh, when, when, you, when you put in drains, you don't just have horizontal drainage, you still got drainage, vertical drainage, and that might be significant. Um, um, well, the, this is the, the complete differential equation, right? You're going to have the, cha the, the change in pore is ex excess pore pressure as a function of time is going to be both the vertical drainage part plus the horizontal drainage part, right? So theoretically, we have to solve this differential equation. Well, that looks like a lot of fun. This is where we enjoy mathematicians. So Carrillo looked at this and showed that we can actually separate the two of these, solve them separately and combine them without significant error. And so what you do is the three-dimensional uh, degree of consolidation is just equal to the, if you want to think about this, the complement of the radial drainage times the complement of the vertical drainage degree of consolidation subtracted from one. So all you got to do is do the vertical calculation, do the horizontal calculation, and then you can estimate the, the three-dimensional effects. So this would be appropriate if you've got a layer where it's not that, 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 that your, your radius of drainage is actually, you know, comparable to the, thick, the, drainage, the vertical drainage thickness. For a very thick layer, this isn't going to affect you at all. So that's nice to know. That's simple. Yeah? So you can do that one. Okay, other things to think about. The equivalent radius of the wick drain. So I'm going to bring one of these in next time. We're going to look at it. There's two ways to approach the equivalent radius of the wick drain. One is to say that the area out, so these things are long and skinny. There's several things going on here. These things are long and skinny. They may look like that. The lance that you use to install them will probably look something like this. And that to scale is probably about it. The lance that you use to install them is much, much bigger than the drain. So one of the theories is uh, that this thing, when it gets in the field, actually, when it starts to fill up with water, it actually blows itself out like this. You still have that little centerpiece in there, but it actually looks more like a tube than it does a flat thing. And if you look at some of the, you, can, you see this in some of the videos, at least near the surface, that definitely happens. The thing balloons out and becomes more round than the other one. So one method is to assume that the equivalent is, uh, is the radial distance. Um, another one is to actually assume that, and I should have put this in there and I forgot, is to assume that the equivalence is to the circumference. 
So you, you, you calculate a radiance that gives you an equivalent circumference. That's the assumption that the thing balloons out. I don't know that there's a right answer to that. I've seen both of them done. I think it's more commonly just to assume the area is the same. Um, the smear zone's really important. Uh, I gave you a really good paper to read that talks about smear. The reason I gave you that one paper to read is it's got a nice discussion of smear zones, it's, and, and I thought it was a really good discussion of smear zones. And I have to tell you, honestly, I haven't looked at Holtz et al.'s discussion of how to estimate <laughs> smear zones, except really briefly. But, but that paper I gave you is really good. So the, the team that's looking at smear zones, you definitely want to look at that paper I gave you. That, that one also discusses vacuum. Uh, well, another way you can speed up the consolidation is you can actually put a vacuum on these things, which is done quite a bit, and that actually increases your head. I think that one also discusses vacuum uh, consolidation, but the, the discussion that's important in there is the smear zone discussion. So, um, so the mandrel area is generally a lot, lot bigger than the area of the of the um, the drain. Uh, so there's a significant um, smear in there. So there's some of that, there's some things that show you that that smear zone can be much, much bigger than just two to three times. Um, there's, some, there's some data out there that suggests that smear zone might be like five times the, 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 uh, the radius of the, man, the effective radius of the mandrel. Um, so that's, uh, that's why one of, you, one of your teams is gonna be looking at that. The, the other thing that can, that can change it is you have really deep wells um, you're going to get resistance to flow in there. There's going to be enough flow in these that, it, that, it, that you're actually going to get resistance to flow, and you've got to account for the hydraulic resistance in the actual drain itself, and that's called well resistance. That's really important for drains that are really, really deep. Because that, 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 that drain's pretty narrow, so you can imagine that you can have a significant amount of resistance to flow in there. And we're not talking about that one. And I think... <laughs>